Coming up on this episode of Photography Online, we give you top tips for taking great holiday photos, we shoot from the comfort of our home, and we show you how to pack a bag. Welcome to part one of our June 2021 show, which is sponsored by Pouch, which I'll be telling you more about later. This month, we're bringing you the show from a rather special place, Armadale Castle. This is one of those under the radar locations here on the Isle of Skye, which often gets overlooked by visitors, but I'm gonna show you why this should be top of your list if you plan on visiting the island. Before all of that though, let's get the show off and running. With international travel opening up again and the summer fast approaching, the photography online experts thought they would share their top tips for taking great holiday photos. If you're often left a little underwhelmed by your holiday snaps then grab a pen and get ready to take notes. Photography is not all about taking amazing images which are good enough to be hung on a wall or entered into a competition. Sentimentally, shots of friends and family are far more valuable than great landscape shots, so it's important to remember to take photos which will act as a record of your time and become treasured memories for the future. When out and about, I often see families on holiday taking photos of themselves to document their experiences. Now, while I appreciate that they're not trying to win any awards with their photos, Sometimes I see them doing something that's fundamentally wrong and I have to resist the urge to run over and offer some advice. Now, I'd probably be told where to go and maybe quite rightly so, but surely these never to be repeated moments should be captured in the best way possible. If you agree, then we've put together a few handy tips to ensure that next time you come back from your travels, you do so with the best possible images. Ideally, you want the sun low in the sky and off to one side. This creates softer light and longer shadows, which are far more appealing in photo. This isn't going to be the case if you're at a location in the middle of the day, so you might want to think about trying to venture out earlier or later than you normally would do. Instead of planning a walk on the beach at 2pm, try doing it before breakfast or after dinner, as this is likely to provide far more attractive light, which can make a huge difference even on shots taken with a phone. The other advantage of being out early or late is that there will be fewer people around. So not only will you get better light, but you also get a better experience of the location that you're visiting. The lower the sun is in the sky, the more attention needs to be placed on where it is in relation to yourself and your subject. If you're taking a family portrait with the light behind you, then your subjects are going to be squinting. And if the light is in front of you, i.e. behind your subject, then you're going to end up with a silhouette. If possible, try to position your subject in the shade, but close to where there's sunlight hitting the ground. This is likely to provide a very flattering light and a sparkle in the eyes. Overcast days provide great light for portraits. When photographing children, try to position the camera at their eye level, as looking down on people rarely has a pleasing outcome unless you want to portray the subject as being vulnerable in some way. The same applies to anyone sitting down. Don't stand over them and point the camera downwards. Instead, crouch or kneel to bring the camera down to their eye level. This gives a much more personal connection between the viewer and the subject. Try to capture natural expressions rather than full smiles. If you ever find yourself shouting, say cheese, then it's probably time to book yourself onto one of our workshops. You can't really capture the spirit of a place without including the local traditions and cultures. And this, of course, is likely to involve photographing the locals going about their daily lives. One can snipe people on a telephoto lens from a distance, but you will never know who they are. These pictures may have merit, but they will certainly not be as personal as they could have been if you'd actually engaged with your subjects. 
Now this engagement can be a daunting experience for many, most, if not all of us photographers, but it can also be incredibly rewarding. So how do we go about overcoming this? If you see someone you would like to take a photo of, here's a tried and tested method. Firstly, and most importantly of all, be yourself and tell the truth and be respectful and have a clear plan of what it is you wish to say in mind before engaging with the person themselves. This will give you confidence and they will sense it. Approach them and say hello. Introduce yourself. Tell them your name and where you come from. Explain that you've come to visit their country or area, etc. and tell them what you've seen so far, being positive of course. Say that you're enjoying your trip very much, but you are looking forward to showing friends and family what a great place it is when you return home. Basically, you are building the impression that you are going to be an ambassador for their home, their area, their country. You can do all of this even if you don't speak the same language. Once you feel the conversation is coming to a natural end, thank them for their time and ask them if it would be okay for you to take a picture or two of them. Explain it will only take a moment or two and be honest and say that it is part of the reason you spoke to them in the first place. They caught your eye. It's the truth, so why not tell them? The answer now will almost certainly be a yes, as they will want to be part of your memories. At this point, you should have a basic idea of the style of picture you wish to create and the rough settings should already be in place on your camera. Once you have someone's permission, don't just take a quick shot and think, thank goodness that's done, and run for the hills, back into the shadows. Take a little time, reposition them, or yourself if necessary. Think about your composition, think about the story you're trying to tell. They will want the photo to be as good as possible, so they should be willing to cooperate with your requests. With this kind of photography, please keep in mind that your pictures are actually not that important you're not shooting images to change the course of history. Although, you never know, I guess. The point is, don't harass people and use your common sense. Keep safe. Make the experience for both you and your subjects a positive one. You can exchange email addresses, you can send copies. Lastly, and importantly, please don't pay people for their time. It's just not cool. The most common mistake with wildlife photography is missing the moment. You need to be able to predict what's going to happen and get the camera ready to record your prediction rather than what's already happening. Many cameras have a slight delay as they try to focus on the subject and this can cause you to miss the shot. To enable the camera to take the photo instantaneously, pre-focus by lightly pressing down on the shutter button until focus on your subject has been confirmed. When your subject is in the right position or doing something interesting, press firmly down to take the photo. If you want to take more than one shot of the same subject, assuming it's not moving closer or further away, then as long as you don't take your finger off the shutter, you can keep pressing and each photo will be immediate as the focus has already been set. There are a couple of very simple rules for ensuring decent architectural shots. The first is to avoid converging verticals. This is where a building looks like it's falling over backwards. And it is caused when you have to point the camera in an upwards direction in order to include the very top of the building. To avoid this falling effect, you need to ensure your camera is pointing straight ahead, dead level. Assuming, of course, you are standing at ground level, you will now probably have lots of unwanted foreground at the very bottom of the frame and will be cutting off the roof of the building at the top of the frame. This is not great, so try to include the top of the building by either turning the camera on its side, zooming out, or by moving further away from the building itself. The important thing is to get the entire building included in the frame without pointing the camera upwards. Take the shot and you will see that the building is now upright and vertical. You may well find that the extra foreground helps set the scene regardless. If you have excess unwanted foreground, simply crop it off later in post-production. The second tip for shooting buildings is to try and include two sides, ideally each one in a different light. For example, if you shoot a building from head on, you won't be able to see either of its sides and regardless of light, it will appear rather flat and one dimensional. But if you move to one side or another and shoot the same building at around 45 degrees, you will now be looking at the front and one of the sides of the building, and this is much better. 
If you can also get the front in sunlight and the side in shade, then this is better still, as it helps you give the building an even more three-dimensional appearance. Try where possible to place your subject away from the centre of the frame. If your subject has a direction, for example has a front and a back, such as a vehicle or a person, then position it so that it's facing into the frame. If your subject has no direction and is being side lit, then try to position it on the opposite side to where the light is coming from. Of course, if you have symmetry around your subject, then placing it in the centre of the frame may work. Generally speaking though, placing your subject off to one side gives a more pleasing balance to your photo. Sometimes you may see an amazing scene in front of you and think, oh, that will make a nice photo. However, upon showing the masterpiece to your friends and family, it may leave them a little bit glassy-eyed and holding back the yawns. A likely culprit could be because your photo is lacking a focal point, somewhere for the viewer's eye to settle on. Adding an anonymous person to your scene can provide such a focal point, and it's often just a case of being patient and waiting for the perfect subject to walk into the perfect position. It sounds obvious, but make sure your lens is clean. This is a common mistake people make when shooting on their phones. How often do you check to see if the lens is free from grubby fingerprints or dust from your pocket when you take a shot on your phone? The smaller the lens, the bigger the problem dirt and grease will cause, so a phone will really suffer in this area. A clean lens will produce sharper images and increased contrast for crisp and clear photos. If you're shooting with the sun in front of you, but not in the frame, then try to place a shadow from your hand over your lens as you take the shot. This will increase the clarity and contrast of your photo. If you're heading off on your holidays soon, then hopefully some of those tips will be useful. Now, as I mentioned, this month we're bringing you the show from Armadale Castle, which is situated in the south of the Isle of Skye and was once the seat of the McDonald's. The castle, gardens and museum are now run by a charitable trust dedicated to promoting the history and traditions of the Clan Donald and the Highlands and Islands. As you can see, it is a great place for photography, especially from May through to October, when the grounds will be looking at their very best. So in just a minute, we're going to be joining our star student with her photographic assistant as we look at what you can do to take wildlife photos without leaving your home. But first, if you're a fan of saving both money and time, and let's face it, who isn't? I think I have something which will be right up your street. When we're not busy filming photography online, our team also lead photography trips around the world. And besides carrying our camera gear, we naturally have other kit as well. I'm off to St Kilda soon and was on the lookout for a new sleeping bag, but I didn't want to spend an arm and a leg. Pouch is a free desktop browser extension that automatically finds and applies discount codes when you're shopping online, which saves you the pain of having to manually search for active codes every time you visit a site. I jumped online to see what I could find. I was shopping on Blacks because they already had a sale running and when I reached the checkout, Pouch automatically searched for codes, found me an extra 20% off and saved me another £11. Pouch works on over 3,000 UK sites, big and small, including popular names like eBay and John Lewis. That's more than any other browser extension that offers a similar service in the UK. It's really simple to set up too. Pouch only takes a couple of clicks to install and then make sure to pin it to your browser. Get a pouch for free right now by clicking the link at the top of this video's description and start saving money today. Now, if you're a regular photography online viewer, you'll be familiar with our Schools Out series, where we've been teaching our eight-year-old star student the basics of photography. This time, she's switching from her film camera to a digital camera as she tries to capture her first photos of garden birds. She's very excited to share everything she's been doing over the past few days. So, without further delay, let's hand you over to the cutest member of the team, along with her not-so-cute father. So welcome to Schools Out, and here we have our star student. Do you remember your name? Shanna. That's a good start, isn't it? And what are we photographing today? We're photographing garden birds. We're in our kitchen looking out our window. And outside here, what have we done? Outside? Um, so we've built like a wee little pole, hang up two bird 
feeders. One's filled with fat balls and the other is filled with seeds and we sprinkle some seeds on the ground and also give them out bread. Okay, um, and why don't you show everybody what you've got in your bird photographer's bag. First of all, let's show everyone what you've got on the front. What, do you know what bird this is? Corn crake. Corn crake, yeah. Have you seen any yet? Um, no. No, you will see some soon though. They'll be here soon. I've got my bird book. Right. So. Why is this important? Because if we meet any new birds that come to our garden, we can look at them in this bird book and then we'll find out the type of bird, what type of bird it is. Yeah. What else is in there? Binoculars, so we can look out the window. Okay, and what kind of binoculars are these? Um, they are small binoculars made by Kite Optics. Are they good binoculars? Yes. Yeah, they're very good for the size, aren't they? Little, mm -hmm. little hands like that, and they're very powerful and very clear. Yes, right now I can see two star starlings feeding on the fat balls right now for the binoculars. Okay, so and what else? Need that. I have got my notebook for writing down all the different types of birds I see each day. So on the first day I started doing the bird watch I've seen a robin, starling and also um, I've seen an eagle. Lots of little girls like you when they started their bird keeping diary they would have put robin at the beginning okay and then the next one down is starling. Now starlings yes. are probably the most common bird that we've seen out of here because yes. they always arrive in, in lots of big numbers don't they? But then third, this is going to be unique to you because no one else is going to have a list of birds that says robin, starling, eagle. Because eagles yes. eagles are very rare in the UK. It's only here in the northwest of Scotland that you can really see them. Yes. But you see them all the time, don't you? Yes. Not, not on the bird table because that would probably fall over if they came down and landed on that. It, it wouldn't be able to take the weight, would it? It would be like me sitting on it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh look at that, Is it, what's that one there? It's a pied wagtail, it's very close to the door because we actually fed out a pile of seeds right at the edge of the door. Why is this called a wagtail? Because what, as it walks it like wags its tail going whoop whoop. How does it go? <laughs> what noise does it make though? <laughs> okay, so let's talk about the equipment that we're going to use, okay, because okay. this is your camera that you've been using up until now, isn't yes. it? But why are we not using this, your camera to do this? Because it's a film camera. Well, at number one, it's a film camera, so you wouldn't be able to see if you were getting good shots, would you? Yes. But more importantly, the longest lens that you've got on this camera is 135 millimeters. Yes. And it's not autofocus. Okay, no. so because the birds are moving a lot, you really need a camera with autofocus so it locks on very quickly. But tell people what lens this is. So we are using the 500mm lens. Okay, and why, what does that do? What does the 500mm do? It makes us, um, can look very close into the birds. While we're waiting for more birds to come down, yes. should we bring in our early warning bird system? Yes, aka my brother. Yeah, so why don't you tell everybody about your brother? So, my brother's name is Miles. He is disabled, so he can't talk. He just makes sounds like mmm, ah, ah. But he likes watching the birds very much, doesn't he? Yes, he's learned a lot about the birds during lockdown and loves watching them. And sometimes we just leave him to sit here and wait for a bird to come. And when a bird comes, he alerts us by shouting mmm, mmm, mmm. Yeah. So, I know that we have many uh, viewers who are you know, limited in mobility and find it difficult to get out of the house. So um, my son is, is severely disabled. So, um, you know, it's not often that he can go to places and take photos, but this is one of those situations where he can get involved and join in. So should we go and get Miles and then he can, he can start taking photos, can't he? Yes, he loves taking photos All right, of let's it. go and get the boy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> there he is. <laughs> now then, this is our early warning system. All right, Miles, are you going to say hello to everybody? Sorry. Miles, are you going to say hello to everybody? Okay, right. Now, when you see a bird, actually, look, before you go any further, it's a good job you've got your camouflage trousers on, Miles, because otherwise the birds would see you, wouldn't they? Yes. Yeah. All right, so. You got your camo gear on. That means you're in stealth mode. 
Okay, so what I want you to do is you tell us when you see a bird, okay? So, because Miles can't um, use binoculars and mm -hmm. can only use his eyes, then uh, we've got the live view on the camera here with a magnified view on. Yes. So that it's the same as him looking through binoculars, basically. So he gets to yes. appreciate the birds close up. And you can also take some photos, can't you? Because you can tell me, uh, you, tell, you tell Daddy when you want to take a photo. Make sure it's a good one. Okay, done. Now that, that's Miles' photo. Every, you captured all of the birds looking over there on the Dude, that's very good time. timing, Miles. Oh. If you want me to take another photo, Miles, you just shout. <laughs> oh, there we go. <laughs> look at that, what great timing. Wow, look at that action shot. So have we got enough photos of birds now? Yes. And what advice would you give people who want to do this from their own house? So I would give them advice to, um, if they have a big window, look out from that window and put up a bird feeder in front of the window and then they can get good shots. Um, find some bird seeds or bird food to bring the birds in for photos yeah. and stuff. And what kind of lens? Do you think they need a, a very long lens to make the birds big in the photo? Yeah, they would need like a quite long lens if um, they have put the bird feeder far, far away. Mm -hmm. But try not to put it too close to the door. It will make the birds feel a little bit nervous and a little bit scared. Yeah, and if you don't want, because we've just been taking pictures of the bird on the fence and on the feeder, haven't yes. we? Because we don't really, we're not, we're not trying to get award-winning photos. We're not trying to get wildlife photos. We're just trying to give you some practice and teach you about birds, aren't we? Mm -hmm. So if people want to take better quality photos, then they could put some branches, like some tree branches outside, yes. so the birds can sit on the branches and then they can photograph them on the branches mm -hmm. instead of on the feeder like we're doing. Yes. And what about the background as well? What do you think is good background? A good background is like some hills or like countryside and stuff. Yeah. Do you think uh, houses are a good background? Mm, not that much. No, no. Not very good. So you want trees or hills? Yeah, or... like nature background. Yeah, nature background. Very good. Okay, Miles, tell us when any birds are coming, okay? That's your job. That's what you're hired for. That's how you get the money. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, that's, that's how you get the money, Miles. What a great way to get young ones into photography as well as nature. All the photos you saw there were taken by the kids and as Marcus explained, while they're not going to win any wildlife awards, they do provide a fun reason to use a camera and teach the importance of becoming familiar with your subject. Now before we go any further, I just wanted to say a huge thanks to everybody who's joined us for our monthly webinar event, MC2 Live. This is our 90 minute live show where we look at various topics, including giving our opinion on some of the photos submitted by our audience. We've now extended the show by adding on some extra time at the end and this part we're making free to watch on our sister YouTube channel MC2 Photography. So if you want to hear the team chatting away about all things photography then give it a watch. There's a link in the description below. And on the subject of our MC2 live webinar we'll hopefully be broadcasting a live sunset shoot in the coming shows so that should be good fun. Please do join us if you can. Still to come we'll be showing you how to best pack a camera bag for travel so stick around for that. Now as you know we like to cover many areas of photography as we can here on Photography Online and this includes film photography. Our regular feature Analog Affairs has looked at a few different cameras over the past year or so and these have always been presented by Marcus. However Nick fancied a piece of the action so borrowed a camera and a couple of rolls of film to see how easy or difficult it is. I've been taking photographs for around 35 years now, which means that when I started, I was using one of these, not one of these. But when the digital revolution arrived, I jumped on board and haven't looked back since. I mean, who would still want to shoot film when it's so much more convenient using one of these? 
Well, it turns out quite a lot of people do, as film photography is going through a major revival. Prices of old film gear were at an all-time low a few years ago when supply outweighed demand, with amazing cameras and lenses going for bargain prices. But now things have changed and the balance has shifted, with demand now outweighing supply. I remember my film days consisting of long waits to see how bad my exposures were, but I reckon I've improved my skills since then. OK, the wait may still be there, possibly even longer, but maybe that's part of the appeal. To find out, I've got hold of an analogue camera and a couple of rolls of film to see if I can discover what all the fuss is about. Having got used to high resolution photos from the latest digital cameras, my expectations as to what is acceptable when it comes to image quality has got much higher since I last shot film, so to go back to 35mm probably won't be giving film much of a chance. So I am taking things to the next level. This is a medium format film camera which takes 6 by 9 cm frames, giving plenty of detail to compete with the standards I am now used to. Now I have to explain, I have never used medium format film before, so this is new territory to me, but how hard can it be? Well, I've decided to document my attempts to see what's driving the current resurgence in analogue photography. Okay. So the first task was to load the film, which sounds quite easy, but if you've never done it before and never been shown, then take it from me, it's not. Now, what I should not be doing is unrolling the film like that. What I should be doing is putting the film into the camera, but as you can see, I'm not. After ruining my first roll of film before I'd even got it into the camera, a new day brought the promise of a new start. So here we go, take two. This week I've been out with a film camera for the first time. Now I've gone to various locations around Sky and I've come here this morning to try and get another shot. I've got a clear horizon over to the east so I will get light. I haven't got a massive amount of clouds behind me but because I'm going to get light I should get a reasonable shot and I'm shooting on Fuji Velvia which is a nice saturated film so that will help um, with the blue sky. Now I've been excited to use a film camera but I've also been rather nervous by using it. Uh, one of the main reasons especially with this camera is that I've only been given two rolls of film and each roll of film only takes eight exposures. And with this particular camera, it's a rangefinder camera, so when you're looking through the viewfinder, you're not actually looking through the lens. So you must remember to take the lens cap off because you won't see that. So let's do that now. So set my composition. Now, like I said, this is a rangefinder camera. And um, when I'm looking through the viewfinder, um, you know, I'm not 100% sure if I've got my composition right. But because this is a 90mm lens, which equates to about 45mm and 35mm cameras, it's given me a slightly wider angle than I would normally shoot this scene from, because I normally shoot this at 50mm. So it gives me a bit of leeway with my composition. So let's just double check that, and there we go. Right, so that's composition check. Now we've got to focus. So I kind of work through this workflow, composition, focus, set my aperture, and then meter from my, from my exposure. So focusing on this is relatively simple, um, but sometimes you don't know if you've exactly got it right. Because when you look through the viewfinder, you've got a tiny circle in the middle, and it's, it's some, I, think, I believe it's called split focusing. So you get to see kind of that part of the scene twice. And as you bring it into focus, they join together. And that is there. Now that happens to be infinity. I know that's fine because Everything in my, in my composition is at infinity, so I kind of help myself by choosing this particular viewpoint. So, composition check, focus check. Now, aperture, I'm going to use F11 for this. Uh, that will give me anywhere from probably about 15 meters to infinity. Okay, so the light is now uh, hitting my scene, so I need to get metering and get a shot in the bag. In the absence of a light meter, I came up with a cunning plan to use a digital camera as a meter. Basically, all I'm doing is metering to make the highlights a mid-tone and then I'm going to increase this exposure by around two stops to ensure the highlights are at the upper limit of the dynamic range of the film. Do, 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 one quarter of a second. Now, I just needed to take the shot. Such a good noise that. So that's my first one. Now, I'm going to overexpose 
this one. So that's half a second. Wind it on. And that should be my... Yeah, yeah it sounds like the, uh, the film is wound all the way on. Fingers crossed I'm not going to do anything wrong here. So there's our film. And now I just need to... Now, remember the trouble I was initially having loading the film on my first attempt? Well, surely getting the film out wasn't going to be that difficult. Oh, God. <laughs> Can't get it out. Ah, there we go. So with what I hoped was a decent shot in the bag, it was time to develop the film and see how it turned out. Following the Photography Online guide to processing your own film, something we featured in our June 2020 show, this was a fairly straightforward exercise and it wasn't long before I was getting the first few of my images. I was really impressed by the results, with this shot being the better of the exposures. As you can see, there's loads of detail in the image, enabling me to print this at a decent size if needed. This may not be my favourite ever shot from this location, but it is unique in that it has that film quality to it which seems impossible to replicate with digital. So what was the conclusion to my first medium format film experience? Shooting on film again after all these years has really been a great experience for me. That jeopardy of not knowing what I've got when I press the shutter button compared to the instant feedback I get on my digital camera. Although it's not for everyone, I can really see why a lot of people are going out there and buying secondhand film cameras. Do I want to do it again? Of course I do. So watch this space. What a great image Nick got there, and it just looks like it was taken off film, if you know what I mean. Which, considering it was, is hardly surprising, but it is amazing how film has a look which just can't be recreated with digital. If you're into your film photography, then next month we have got a real treat for you. In fact, even if you've never shot a film in your life, you still really need to see our next Analogue Affairs, as we'll be in the company of someone who is regarded by the world's best known photographers as being the master of the darkroom. I've already seen it and was immediately inspired to get out and shoot a roll of black and white film. It is definitely something not to be missed. Now at the start of the show we gave you some tips on how to take great holiday photos but before you can even think about any of those you need to travel somewhere. Knowing what to take and how to pack can be a daunting task so when preparing for a recent trip with Marcus I grabbed the opportunity to get some space saving tips from someone who spent several years flying around the world as a professional travel photographer. When recently packing for a week-long work trip, I had that usual conundrum of how to best pack all my things. Travel hairdryer, all the essentials. With camera gear, plus all my clothes and other paraphernalia, it's never long before I resemble Phileas Fogg about to embark on an 80-day around the world trip. Oh, hat. But Marcus always seems to be able to fit everything into one bag, despite having way more camera gear than me. In a quest to find out the secret formula to packing like a pro, I gave him a call to see if he would share any tips I could apply to reduce my excess baggage. Hello. Oh, you made it. I did. I need to see this, uh, where this magic happens. Okay, so what I've done is I've laid everything out because when you called me, I'd literally just finished packing. Uh -huh. So you couldn't have called at a worse time. This comes from years and years of traveling around the world with cameras. And it's not an easy thing to do, but the mistake a lot of people make is that they pack their camera bag and they're left with so much wasted space in there. So I'm going to show you how to make the most of that empty space. And the way we do that is we, we use clothes for extra padding. So your clothes are actually just to fill up space? Correct. The first thing you think about is your camera gear. Well, that's the, when I go clothes shopping, I don't think about style or price. I just look at it and go, that will go nicely down the side of the 70 to 200 millimeter lens. Okay, different ways of working, I think, but let's see what you've got. Okay, so we've got two cameras. We've got a digital camera over there, and we've got four lenses, which is probably more than most people would take. Yes. Um, and then a massive 
film camera and film in a light meter as well, just so that, you know, if I can get all of this in and you've only got one camera and three lenses, then there's no excuse. You've got filters, four filters, filter holder, batteries, battery charger, and then on top of that, we've got enough clothes to last for a week. Ah, okay. So that means seven pairs of socks, because there's nothing better than fresh pair of socks on in the morning, seven pairs of pants, seven t-shirts, and then two pairs of trousers, but one of them I'm wearing. Okay. So I put a clean one on before you go. My jumper, I'd only ever wear one jumper. Right. Because we're gonna, I mean, it's summertime now. You're, You're not, not planning going. going out for the evening and uh, pick, take a nice pair of chinos or something? I'm no. going on a photography trip. Okay. I'm like, this is not fine dining. <laughs> so this is what we do. Oh, and I'm gonna have a computer as well. So we'll put the computer in there to start with, because that's now out the way. You've got a power okay. adapter for that as well? Uh, I can get one in a minute. All right. so I know that you're going to be keeping tabs on I it. am. I've actually okay. got a checklist, so, so go for it. First thing I'm going to do is put the camera into this little space here. But you might notice that there's a load of space underneath here which is currently not being used. So we want to use that. So I reckon a t-shirt will go nicely underneath there. So we'll put a t-shirt underneath there. And then there's still loads more space either side. So I won't get my pants out to show you. Um, those in any more detail, I but th that. those those can go over the top like that, and then we can probably get another T-shirt like that. So, just in a space where most people would just have a camera and a lens, I've managed to get four items of clothing in as well. That okay? is quite impressive. Whopping great medium format camera that can go in there, and again we've got all of this room around here. So let's just pad that out with T-shirts and pants and things because obviously we're not going to be using the bag for photography so once we get to the hotel we'll unpack we'll take all the clothes and put those in and we'll just repack the camera bag as a camera bag so access to our gear is of least importance at the moment always leaves the socks till last because they're good to fill in little gaps <laughs> to be honest obviously you're, you're packing for a guy let's be fair right now well i haven't oh, checked recently oh. but i think <laughs> i think i tick that box or a very low maintenance person so you do want a nice a nice rucksack with kind of separate pockets and stuff that you can put your bits and pieces in. Yeah, I think so, um, because otherwise everything's going to be rubbing together and yeah. that's not what you want. But this this bag here is a mind shift. I think it's called a First Light yeah. 40. And this is the largest bag that is airline compatible, carry-on compatible. So I don't have to check this in. This is why you have it, because yeah. you're cheap and you can actually... No, it's nothing to do with being cheap. It's to do with not wanting to check my photo gear into... Fair um, enough. A, a play. I don't want baggage handlers throwing this around. Although, to be fair, because it's going to be so well packed, mm. I wouldn't mind people throwing this around a bit because I know that it's going to be safe. I mean, I, I used to travel with a much bigger bag and it went around the world several times and I never had any breakages. So hang on, wait, wait, wait. You just put one toothbrush. Is this the extent well, how many, of how your many toothbrushes do you need? Is this the extent of your toiletries? Well, I'm going to maybe put a, a bit of toothpaste in as well. Okay, no shampoo. No, because you get shampoo at hotels. When you go to a hotel, but you can't you always rely on it. What kind of establishments are you staying in? <laughs> okay, so if you're going to be travelling to a warm place and you maybe want to bring some sun cream with you, yeah, will that fit in there? Yeah, yeah, because I've got the look. This, this is this is basically these two compartments here are reserved for Ruth items. This is for your holiday I, souvenirs. That I knew you'd be pedantic about and go. Well, you haven't got this, and okay, you haven't got pedantic. that. Okay, so, pedantic. As a, okay, as a woman, there are certain things that we maybe bring that you guys don't think about so much. Shampoo being one of them. Well, right? but I've answered that question okay, already. Okay, so this this might look large to you, but that, you that contains essentials. Soaps, shampoos, various things that uh, people need when they go away. So, I mean, are you going to stuff that in there? Uh, no, because what... You see, this, this is the problem. This is a bag which, if you had it in here, would be one of the biggest wastes of space ever. So a bag you're saying take bag. everything out and stuff Take everything it into out and, and split it up and put it into different places. You don't need a bag within a bag. No, all right, okay. Okay, so sun hat? Sun hat, well, okay, I don't have a sun hat because I just soak it up like a man. But if I did need a sun hat, I'd have one of those flat, you know, flat ones that packs flat and I would put it in here on, to, on top of my computer. There's loads of room in there. You do, that you do get, have some space in there. You could get loads of stuff in there and look, I've got another space here as well, which I can put stuff in. In fact, look here, I've even got some waterproof trousers. I didn't even know they were in there. That's how well packed they are. We don't need those where we're going. So that's my sun hat. Okay. okay. Shoes? They'll be on my feet. Just the one pair then? Well. I mean, how many pairs do you need? So look, that's me with two cameras, four lenses, 
and enough clothes for a week. Okay, it's not entirely you, you've got a tripod lying okay, there. Okay, so this is the sticking point. Yeah. Um, because of the spikes particularly, but you could take those off and put rubber feet on, but um, that, that obviously, that, that, that was strapped to the side of that, but I think... I think you wouldn't be allowed. I, I don't think security would let you go on the plane with this. So you'd have to, you'd have to either check that in or not take it. It depends what kind of you know, trip you're going on, obviously. Um, so that's the sacrifice. But if I was going somewhere for longer than a week um, or somewhere you know, longer haul with more gear, then I would have another separate duffel bag and that would go in there wrapped with clothes. Okay, so you're not averse to having a check-in bag and just... No, no, if you're going long haul, then you normally get your check-in bag as part of the ticket anyway. Yes. Um, but I'm talking about going to Europe where they charge you £100 for your ticket and then charge you £400 if you want to take a bag on as well. That's true. So this is the best way to do it. It's the safest way to do it because this can't get lost mm -hmm. if it's not out of your you know, sight. Okay, fair enough. I, I'm slightly impressed. I mean, travel hair dryer obviously isn't in there. and uh, yeah, You get that in the hotel. Not always. And you have to my hair never every... has trouble drying by itself. So you're all set. Do you now know how to pack and how to get great shots during your holidays? If you're able to get away, then I hope you do have a great time. Feel free to let us know in the comments where you're heading and send us your best shots when you return. We'll be doing a travel themed surgery session at the end of the summer, so we could be featuring one of your images. Okay, so that's it for part one of this month's show, but do join me for part two in just a couple of weeks. We'll be back here at Armadale Castle to show you around a little more. We'll be continuing the theme of travel by looking at three different types of bags, and we'll be explaining everything you need to know about lenses, including busting one of photography's greatest myths. Don't forget to give us a thumbs up if you enjoyed the show, and please tell your friends about us, as we know there are still lots of photographers out there who are missing out. You'll also find links for more information about Armadale Castle, how to purchase photography online t-shirts, hats and tutorial books and how to follow us on our new Facebook page. Okay so I've got five seconds left which gives me just enough time to say until next time take good care but most of all take good photos. Mm -hmm.